Okay, um, we are three minutes after five. We'll start this webinar on UBI and the pandemic in Europe. Welcome everybody. Um, we have um, yeah, an, uh, a wonderful event in front of us and I'm very much looking forward um, to also presenting our speakers in just a bit. Um, so we're gonna hear in the order of appearance, Simo Raitila, uh, Valeria Korosek, Korosek, and Natalie Bennett, um, who is not here yet, but who will join us in just a few seconds. As I said, the topic to, of today is UBI and the pandemic in Europe. And I'd like to thank um, the organizers, and that is Luca and Sol in the background um, for organizing and preparing this event. And overall, I'd like to thank the European Foundation for the organization with the support of Transition Data. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, dive right into it. And um, so there's Simo telling us about um, the, um, sorry, about the Jeff publication, Steps Towards Universal Basic Income, the effect of the COVID-19 crisis on welfare policies and support for UBI in the European Union. Um, before uh, Simo starts, I'll just present all the, uh, all the speakers and then, um, Simo, you can start right away. So as I said, Simon is starting. He's a PhD student in sociology at the University of Helsinki. He is the coordinator of the Finnish think tank Visio that you can, adver can see advertised here already. Um, and in 2018, he worked on uh, last resort social assistance register research at Kela, the social insurance institution of Finland. Next in line, there is Valeria Korosek, Korosek, sorry. <laughs> she, has a, she holds a PhD in postmodern sociology, is the representative of Slovenia in the Basic Income Earth Network, and is also very much involved in the European Citizens Initiative for Unconditional Basic Income, of which we might hear also a bit from here. Um, and additionally, she is the representative of the European Network for the Fair Sharing of Working Time. Very much looking forward to her to hear her contribution. And last but not least, and she'll join us in just a few minutes, um, Natalie Bennett. She is a green, she is a green member, and I think actually the only green member of the House of Lords in the U in the UK. She was the leader of the Green Party of England and Wales from 2012 and 2016, and before that, she worked for over 20 years as a journalist, including for um, institution, institutions such as the Bangkok Post, the Times, and as the editor of the Guardian Weekly. And now, without further ado, I'd like to, um, yeah, give the stage to Simo. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, as I don't need to go through the introduction, I'm just quickly gonna say that I have followed basic income for many years. And written on it for the Green European Journal. And Simo, just, Simo, just one uh, second. Okay. What we see from you now is I think your presenting screen where we see your notes. Okay, not yeah, so much that's the rest. So maybe be. you want to change that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for that. No worries. Does it seem to be right now? That looks better. There we go. If I do this, is it still all right? Uh, no. Just a moment, I'm gonna try and check sure. it because it worked before. It shouldn't be the window, but it should be an... Hmm. Also, if it doesn't work, just go on like this. I just wanted yeah. to let you know. Yeah. I'm. Yeah, for some reason it doesn't really want to do the. Uh, no worries. The, the presentation effect doesn't work when it's yeah. supposed to. So. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, let's go on like this okay. then. And uh, yeah, so I was saying I have, I have written on multiple occasions on the Finnish UBI trial for the Green family. And 
And the newest text I have written is in the second volume of the European Green Perspectives on Basic Income, uh, which is something I will discuss later today. And uh, the background or the work that I will discuss now is the summary report that we did in the Basic Income Project of the Green European Foundation. Uh, last year, during the COVID pandemic, we decided that it would be a good idea to have a survey of uh, the member organizations to see what kind of social policy changes were made in the, each country. And uh, additional research was done using uh, Eurofound's database where they also collected different policy reactions. And this was published recently, I think, at, 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 uh, just kind of a couple of weeks ago. Our research questions were, um, we were trying to find, find out uh, uh, if, uh, if there were changes that could be uh, called steps towards basic income. The idea was that during the pandemic, there were social policy responses to it. And uh, we wanted to know what they are telling us about our welfare states. And uh, additionally, yeah, we wanted to know uh, what happened to UBI discussion in these countries and uh, are the current policies uh, uh, sufficient in a situation such as a pandemic. And we collected the information in this huge uh, qualitative table and uh, kind of tried to interpret them from there. What I want to say and why I have research in quotation marks is that this is not peer-reviewed scientific research. This is a report done. Has, it has some methodology to it, but uh, yeah, it would not probably go through in a scientific journal, which is important to understand when citing this or referring to this work. And the steps that we defined as being kind of more towards basic income or having the same kind of effects that people are hoping from basic income is that it would bring about an increase in benefit levels and decrease poverty, or, and it would be kind of, uh, the changes would be more long-term than the normal social policies. Uh, more people would be, would get the benefit. It would have less bureaucracy than the current systems, and it would eliminate welfare traps. So to incentivize working or activation, and it would reduce means testing and sanctioning within the welfare system, which is one of the uh, main things that makes basic income, basic income, it is unconditional. And I'm not gonna go through these long lists in detail, but uh, there is one example on the right out of what kind of things we looked at. So we had uh, a list of these social policy reactions uh, under these categories of steps towards basic income, and then we kind of interpreted kind of what we found. Uh, to jump to the results, the overwhelming number of measures uh, were aimed at self-employed people, part-time workers, art artists, and stuff like that. So people who, who we would uh, call often identify as being a part of the precariat, precariat or uh, small time, small entrepreneurs and people like that. Uh, they were quickly recognized as not being supported by the normal welfare system and steps were taken to alleviate this during the pandemic. Uh, I think that th we found a difference between uh, different countries that uh, corresponds to the old uh, Esping under Senian welfare state regime uh, classification that uh, the social democratic countries uh, didn't really have such drastic changes during the time as they already had some policies in place that were only introduced elsewhere during the pandemic and our benefit levels are, are already higher and some countries with normally more meager social so welfare states adapt through market interventions for example banning evictions or providing people with food and stuff like that uh, in kind measures and especially like the United Kingdom, which is something it would be interesting to hear from Natalie, was one country that uh, acted differently, mostly supporting people through their employers. So not uh, so much focusing on people 
not employed even before the pan pandemic. And the most UBI-like policy that I think we found was in Portugal, where they extended the length of the unemployment benefit and temporary, temporary suspended or all eligibility reassessments. So if you were on unemployment in benefit, you could stay on the unemployment benefit during the pandemic, which meant more uh, predictable amount of income in your hands and less means testing and social control. Uh, mostly we didn't find changes to last fruits or social assistance. Uh, Spain accelerated its uh, uh, minimum income scheme and uh, Finland and Belgium increased the level and Finland sus temporarily suspended its penalization of benefit recipients if they fail to seek employment or act in a manner that is not uh, preferred by the system. And uh, then we also looked at the discussion. I will only quickly go through this. Uh, uh, we saw that uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion on how the current welfare systems were not enough. Uh, the pandemic showed their flaws. Uh, emergency UBI, so a temporary UBI was discussed in many countries, of course, uh, in, in a small manner implemented in, for example, in the United States, not an European country, but important to note. And uh, we are currently still kind of in the midst of this discussion as the debate on an European ba level basic income is still going on. There is an European citizens initiative that is still taking names. And uh, this is the last uh, sentence from our report that in the time of unequal globalization and the climate crisis, unfortunately, COVID-19 will not be the last crisis we will have to face and protect people from. Uh, this was my first presentation for today. Thank you. Great, Simo, thanks so much. Thanks so much for uh, yeah, giving us some background on the publication. I'll uh, post the link in a second, or Simo, maybe you can do that as well so that people can um, find the publication. Uh, <clears throat> but then also like uh, your, your last slide, how um, the pandemic and the uh, means taking, means taken by uh, some governments in order to fight it um, were, um, yeah, uh, how, they, how they changed the debate in this specific country. I think that's uh, yep. stuff for a good conversation afterwards. Um, so we'll take questions as soon as the as we had the uh, the, the presentations uh, all done, and then open the discussion for uh, the audience. Next in line, um, we have Valeria. Uh, yes, I hope my presentation is there. Can you hear me? We can hear you, we can see okay. your presentation, you can start right away. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, very glad I can speak uh, in uh, at this event. Uh, I just want to say uh, there's, a, I believe, uh, important uh, n uh, information that I recently joined the Freebies Micro Simulation uh, Universal Basic Income Team. Uh, so that you will know uh, where to find uh, some uh, additional information about basic income. And now I would like to speak about uh, what happened in Slovenia during uh, um, COVID. But uh, first of all, I would like to uh, listeners to understand where is Slovenia and uh, that it's in the, we, we used to say in center of Europe, uh, that it's very small country and uh, there's only around 2 million inhabitants. I believe this is very important uh, information when we speak about Slovenia. Um, then the first uh, uh, information about uh, COVID measures and the basic income is that uh, Slovenia is uh, actually the only country that introduced uh, universal income during COVID for self-employed people. Uh, actually, there were uh, three different measures similar to basic income uh, idea there was uh, also universal unconditionally uniform income 
on the level of minimum wage for clergy. Uh, and there were universal unconditional holiday vouchers for all residents in Slovenia. Uh, well, here um, uh, the, uh, down the slide, uh, it's uh, the, the uh, title of uh, Social Policy Committee Annual Review of the Social Protection Performance Monitor. Uh, well, there are recent information about uh, social policy measures during COVID as well. Uh, and uh, here is like universal basic income for self-employed for Slovenia, where you can um, see, well, that it's true what I'm saying. Uh, but uh, now I would like to speak uh, how it happened that uh, um, our government introduced this measure or those measures. So uh, as some people might know that Slovenia is the only country that uh, uh, got, uh, succeeded in getting uh, national quota signatures in ECUBI 2020-2022. Uh, uh, I'm even more proud that we succeeded that uh, in two months and now uh, we, we well, we'll try to, uh, I don't know, to be uh, the first uh, on the line uh, to the end. Uh, the next uh, question is uh, how that happened. Why is Slovenia so, I don't know, special? For now, it's special. Well, uh, I can speak about timeline, what happened in Slovenia, how we have built uh, our, our uh, community, how we have uh, built our presence in, uh, in the news, and uh, how well we made the concept of uh, UBI um, known through not only media, but uh, that the people, well, at least they said, well, we heard about the concept, although um, not uh, a lot of people understood it uh, well. Uh, how it happened? Well, I would say that uh, we have a really good uh, circulation of information from academia through NGOs, uh, public media. Then uh, there were political parties, conferences, uh, two elections ago in uh, 2012, 13. Uh, and then uh, we had um, a feasibility study already in 2010. Uh, and the first proposal, the, um, maybe it's good, or I don't know if it's good or bad, we only have one proposal, which is good enough to show people that, uh, um, that basic income is possible to introduce even in budget neutral way. Uh, but lately, Oh, this is uh, just micro simulations, which uh, shows that uh, if we would introduce a uh, basic income, we would have even uh, surplus uh, during the austerity years. Uh, and then here is a um, presentation I did uh, at uh, um, um, uh, UNICEF conference. The question was, is uh, basic income for children better than means-tested uh, um, universal child grant? And uh, micro simulation showed that yes, it is. It, for the same amount of money, we get a uh, reduced, uh, reduced level of child poverty. But then you see there, uh, then I found out, well, where is the problem of uh, uh, implementation of basic income? Already yeah, this... Just a, just a small reminder, uh, that'd be great if you could uh, come to an end within... Yes, I will. Look, the point is that right now we have, uh, we have uh, success in introducing um, basic income by the name. 
but it, it's the time of the government where Slovenia is the almost the worst country in the EU um, regarding, uh, regarding trust. As you can see, well, what's the problem? The problem is that society doesn't work anymore. During COVID, we have, we have a complete enemy shutdown of all the systems, uh, science, academia, NGOs, nothing works. And that's a Slovenian problem right now. So uh, that um, I can say, I'm not optimistic about universal basic income to be uh, uh, to be the the scheme uh, in the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much for your um, yeah for your information about what's going on in Slovenia. Um, that's great to hear, and we'll go over to either um, Natalie Bennett if she's here. I can't see her as the discussion participants. Um, bum, 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 bum. Luca, can you tell me whether she's present anywhere else? I don't think so. If that's not the case, then I'd suggest we'll um, start or go over to Simo again, who will tell us about um, UBI during the pandemic in Finland. Simo, does this work for you? Yeah, it works. Just a sec that I can get back to my slides because I was yeah. looking at the interesting numbers. Uh, uh, well, yeah, just uh, presented from the uh, Citizens Initiative. Just a second. Sure. Okay, I can see my notes, but uh, at least you can see the slides. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, and as said, I have written many articles to the Green Airpoint Journal. I already said this, we don't need to go through this. And I will actually skip to, for today the part on the UBI trial. Uh, or the details on it, because we I had a presentation on it a uh, little time ago. If, if you can get these slides later, you can check them out. So I've included the presentation on them, but I'm just going to skip most of them. Uh, this one I'm going to briefly discuss, which is the results that uh, uh, many of the re many researchers and uh, people even in political parties supporting basic income were not happy in how the trial was uh, done. Uh, but the results are uh, results are so that uh, employment effects, which were most of the interest to the current government at the time, were not really found. Uh, no negative or positive effects of basic income on work in, in the group of uh, uh, mostly long-term unemployed people who were the recipients. But uh, a uh, less robust study, which was not uh, like a controlled trial, uh, found that uh, results on well-being and life satisfaction that were uh, similar to earlier basic income studies, that is beneficial. That uh, basic income helped people to uh, live more happily and uh, with less uh, mental ill-being. And uh, here we are today, uh, that there is a two parliamentary term, uh, social security committee working in Finland to overhaul our whole social security system. Uh, they are working currently and they consist of experts, officials and politicians from all parties in the parliament. So uh, they are currently, for example, discussing different models and uh, basic information on it is also available in English. Uh, uh, what makes uh, basic incomes um, future in the working group not so uh, bright looking are the party stances on universal basic income. Uh, for uh, the only parties that you can see here that are 
most uh, in based on an elections vote matter done by one major newspaper in Finland. Uh, the, only in the Green Party and the Left Alliance, uh, people are staunch supporters, or kind of the elected uh, politicians are staunch supporters. Even in the Center Party, which officially calls its model basic income, most are against the idea that in the future citizens should get a basic income without conditions. Uh, their party's official stance is pro-basic income, but the models they have proposed are more akin to the models proposed by Christian Democrats, the National Coalition, and Social Democrats, which move, look more like a, a universal credit as seen in the United Kingdom. Yeah, and as said before. Uh, and the Social Democrats have also proposed an earned income tax credit kind of benefit, which would only be paid for people who are employed and earn, earn a certain amount. So that because their uh, effective marginal tax rate cannot be decreased any further, so kind of the, how much they actually pay in the sense of losing uh, some benefits and paying taxes, uh, when the tax level cannot be changed anymore, uh, they would be compensated by uh, a benefit. That is the earned income tax credit. And there were, three trial study or studies planned in the government program, which were a negative income tax trial, which would uh, follow the uh, universal basic income study. But uh, it seems that there's not enough funding for it. And it seems to have been one, according to the newest information, to be watered down even to only being a study of earned income tax credit. This is something that uh, will probably still be forcefully discussed between the government parties. And uh, then there was an academic experiment uh, discussed that would have compared different kind of uh, incentives to work or kind of effects to increase uh, employment, monetary, uh, that is like the basic income, uh, information, and then uh, uh, decreasing bureaucracy. Uh, if a trial is started in 2023, uh, there might not be enough time or budget to make it any more a worthwhile one than the last one was. And then I have included a lot of uh, reading that has been beneficial to me uh, when I have written uh, these different reports, and which uh, I think uh, offer a quite good view into uh, different uh, aspects of basic income discussions. Thank you. Thanks so much for the uh, input from Finland. Um, do we have Natalie Bennett with us? I can't see her now. Natalie, are you with us? Not for now, I think. Luca, do you know anything about her or Seoul? Uh, she didn't try to join yet, unfortunately. No? OK, so we'll just, uh, I think, continue with the conversation. Valeria has a question. For uh, actually, uh, I would like to uh, share some uh, information about uh, uh, political parties and basic income in Slovenia. So um, people uh, in all European social surveys were in favor for uh, universal basic income for years. That's why we, we have so many signatures, of course. But uh, then we had a strategy uh, that uh, we didn't want to uh, give the, the concept and the um, possibilities to uh, take basic income idea uh, solely for one political party. So our organization, uh, Basic Income Promotion Network, went to all parties. We said, well, they all need to know about the concept. And uh, even our members of our network, they, they uh, went to all different kinds of parties. And we thought this is a good idea. But uh, uh, in this year, we found out it was not so. Uh, 
because all parties knew the idea, knew how good it is, but if they couldn't uh, make some points during the elections on that part, they found it useless. So it would be better to sell the idea to one big party, you know? That's, uh, that's my point. Then uh, during the um, European elections previously, we, we started to, to think and uh, started with uh, independent UBI list for European uh, elections. And do we have that in mind for the next elections? Mm -hmm. That's the first point. The, 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 what I would like to say is that we have in Slovenia super election uh, year next year. It's going to be local elections, um, national parliament election, national council elections, and uh, president elections. So everything. And now we would like to see how they they st uh, stay on the uh, universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Well, they said you know, in the previous uh, elections, they are all in favor. Even uh, they, they were in national parliament demanding from the Ministry of Finance to calculate again how, how much is possible. But right now they are quiet, completely quiet. Uh, one sociologist uh, last night said, well, in Slovenia, we have polite uh, neoliberals and not polite uh, neoliberals. Our government right now is not polite, but it's, you know, neoliberals anyway and anyhow. Uh, and uh, what is even worse is that uh, because they have stolen our brand name, we have like universal basic income. We we um, made this concept well known uh, using our definition, universal, unconditional, and so on. And they just took our name and they present it as minimum wage income supplement. And now people are coming back to us and saying, oh. well, what have you done? I mean, uh, you you are proposing something so bad, and it's not my fault. I mean, they yeah. just stole okay. our name. That's 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 interesting to hear. Thanks so much for for the info. I think Simo had a direct comment to that, and I, then I'd like to open the discussion to the audience. Uh, Jörg Böhm had his hand up <clears throat> for quite yeah. a while, and then there was a comment from Reinhard Hus from also a while ago. So I've noted this. I have you guys on the list. But first, Simo, and then we'll open the discussion. Yeah, uh, just to uh, comment uh, that that uh, kind of using the brand name of basic income is the same problem that we have that uh, with the center party, which is one of the big old parties, that they want to call their model basic income because their supporters uh, uh, support basic income or part of them or a meaningful amount of them support basic income. But then this is not seen in the elected officials and the party's official uh, or kind of party sovereign models. Uh, and the second thing is, which I kind of uh, discussed a little bit in my uh, uh, report or the uh, COVID report, which is something that I would like to clarify from your Valeria. So is it uh, so that uh, you don't currently in Slovenia have a minimum income scheme? Uh, that, no, that is, we, that is we do. You do. Yeah, but, but kind of if, if we would, Imagine a country without it, a basic income would be a kind of uh, more beneficial in comparison to having it in a country like Finland with already a high level of different uh, uh, social benefits. It's, it's, uh, our problem is to kind of implement it in a very complex system of hundreds of different kinds of benefits. And uh, for example, in the developing countries or kind of uh, in the case of our report in Kenya, uh, it, it can have more bang for the buck, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I know, but- let's, uh, let's, I, I wanna interrupt here in order not to have only a conversation between the two of you, but actually have the audience speak as well. So I'd like to give uh, Joop Boom a chance uh, that he can come up. Um, Luca, can we organize this in a way that, um, we can add everybody to the audience here or like to the discussion panel. Uh, yes, you should be able to speak now. 
just unmute yourself. Luca or Saul, um, how does it work? How can I admit or like give them a mic basically? Um, so yeah, I, I gave you the right to speak. Uh, so you just need to unmute yourself at this point, Yop, but it should work. Okay. Yop, does that work for you? Can you unmute yourself? Yop, are you still with us? If not, um, is Reinhard Hust still with us? Yes. Reinhard, I think you had a question in the beginning that was uh, regarding the first presentation from Simo. And it was, it was what are social de democratic countries? Do you mean Scandinavian countries? Um, do you want to explain this a little further? Yeah, I already uh, said it in text. But if Reinhard has something else to ask, uh, I can just clarify here that, yes, I was talking about uh, Nordic countries. And uh, it was based on the old classic of welfare state regimes by Jesta Esping Andersen, a Swedish uh, researcher. Is that what you mean, Reinhard? What you meant? Sorry. Yes, if you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Because I mean, I've never heard this term. I mean, I heard that there are lots of social democratic policies in Scandinavian countries, but I haven't heard them as described as social democratic countries. So. I normally associate parties with uh, the term, so thanks. Yeah, I can, if I can, I will also use this point or time to, uh, that I will be discussing this more in the upcoming chef uh, publication on, on just transition. So there I will also explain these welfare regimes and how they relate to kind of issues of universality and just transition. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Thanks so much. Are there any other questions from the audience? There, what is this? There was a comment, Slovenia is regarding poverty among very developed countries, a lot of current benefits that would be replaced. So I think that was uh, a response to what Simo just said. I think um, he didn't want to compare Slovenia to other low income countries somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this was to clarify that point, right? Lai, I would still like to say something. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, you see, uh, I do believe that uh, in the future, even the European Union will have to check it out a little bit more about um, uh, social welfare systems in uh, ex or post-socialist countries. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, inequality and everything, Slovakia, che Czechia, and Slovenia, we are uh, the best uh, among uh, poverty um, uh, alleviation programs for children and uh, even for the others. So I would be, I mean, I think others on might be, you know, old. Okay, thanks so much. Are there additional questions or comments from the audience? Uh, if not, I have a question or, or more like a suggestion um, or comment rather. Um, so you guys were talking about um, how the name of basic income was used by be it other parties or other organizations and then used in a different form that basic income has this definition of being unconditional, no means testing, no behavior testing, and so on. And they just take the name because there's obviously no copyright on it um, and use it for something else. And this is something that I see in Germany as well. There was like some, some one example in at least Berlin, not all over Germany, but in Berlin, that was the case. And also I think in, in France, um, there's uh, Macron who introduced a he called it Revenu Universel d'Activité, so something like an universal activation revenue uh, or income. And so that also has in its core nothing to do with basic income. But for some reason, and I think it's not a coincidence, um, it's using these terms that are in universal basic income as well. And I think it's, it's an interesting point you made, uh, Valeria, that 
people come back to you and then complain what kind of stuff you suggested, although it wasn't you, but other people who just used the name. Um, and I think it's something that might appear quite often in the future when there's actually going to be a heated debate in a country about universal basic income. Do you, from a Finnish perspective or a Slovenian perspective, have an idea of how to go about it? So I think, um, Valeria, you suggested not necessarily addressing all parties at once, but just going to one. So there was some strategic advice of how going, uh, going about it. But if assuming that that stage has already happened, so basic income is already used as a term for other things than actually basic income. How do you think this can be, this can be fought back or like what, what can we do about it? Well, in Slovenia, we have uh, three different uh, um, strategies. I mean, we always jump on any opportunity that comes, you know. So uh, at the beginning, when uh, they introduced universal basic income uh, at the, the beginning of COVID crisis, we were very happy because we said, well, people would get in the ear the, the notion of it, the name of it. Everyone will know what it, ha what it is. But uh, afterwards, when everything what this government is doing is bad, you know, even uh, um, vaccines are bad just because this government uh, is supplying them. So everything that is connected is, is uh, I don't know, dirty or, or wrong. So what we can do? Well, um, some people already said, well, just uh, go by uh, uh, any other name just go with the, the, I don't know, citizen wage or social wage or whatever. But you see, I don't think that's, uh, that's very clever. I mean, uh, we, they can steal uh, another brand name easily as the first one. Mm -hmm. But we have the theory be behind it. And we, we cannot just jump uh, around uh, with, with um, I don't know, definition, explanation, and uh, the concept and everything. So I, uh, I am planning to fight it for the brand name and get it back. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Simo, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, as I'm working so closely with the Green Party, I, uh, I have less of an idea on how to uh, actually kind of uh, go to other parties and help them in understanding basic income. But I, I, I need to think that what has been so beneficial in Finland is that we had the trial. And before we had the trial, we had the micro simulations on the costs. And the, the Greens uh, have uh, kind of gained expertise and, and expert status on it because we have been the ones uh, publishing, publicizing such uh, studies. and. Uh, we also, I think we have a pretty good kind of uh, respect for kind of non-political experts in Finland. So for example, uh, when kind of we have a social policy expert publishing reports, uh, they have a lot of weight in the political discussion. And that is kind of one thing that we can use to uh, curb the discussion in the, the right direction which is of course something that I am interested in uh, because of working in a political think tank uh, that uh, studies basic income. And just to quickly touch on the uh, social or uh, citizens dividend or different names discussion, I think it's okay to use a different name if you are talking about a different thing because we could use kind of things like basic income, for example, uh, in, in the green just transition to uh, pay a social dividend to compensate some losses to the poorest people in our societies. But that is not kind of uh, the same thing as basic income as the main block or main benefit of our social security uh, systems. Yeah, okay, thanks so much. There, we have another question for Simo, but I'd like to uh, put that back for a while because Natalie Bennett just joined us. I'm very happy to have you here, Natalie. Um, and uh, yes, today for our session on UBI and the pandemic in Europe, we'll also hear the national report from the UK from Natalie Bennett. Uh, Natalie, the floor is yours.
Natalie, can you hear us? She might just have lost reception or so. She was with us just a second ago, right? There she is. Let's see. Hi, Natalie, can you hear us? You're still muted. Can you hear me? We can hear you, we can see you. We're very happy you're here and we're very much looking forward to your contribution about um, UBI during the pandemic in the UK. Well, thank you very much. And I want to apologize profusely to everyone for my extreme lateness. I was in a debate in the chamber and um, it was expected to finish, finish about 45 minutes earlier than it did. And once you committed to the chamber, you really can't leave. Uh, it's just the nature of sometimes one get caught. So apologies for that. Um, but I think I bring some really exciting news in terms of the impact of the COVID pandemic on the debate on universal basic income in the UK. Um, it has, I think even before the pandemic started, we were sort of seeing uh, universal basic income as an issue rising up the agenda, and we were starting to see real grassroots support for it. But um, COVID-19 pandemic has very, very much highlighted um, the extreme insecurity of so many people's lives in the UK and the fact that um, whether it's zero hours contract, insecure employment, uh, simply inadequate pay to meet people's needs, benefit sanctions. I've just been listening to a bishop in the House of Lords speak in very, very strong terms for a bishop about the impact of a benefit cap that if hits families with more than two children who are simply left without enough money to live on. Um, so we've seen a really acceleration. We've seen the development of a large number of UBI labs, um, which is you know, a grassroots based organization starting, started out in Sheffield, spreading far beyond the UK, but is particularly strong in the UK. We've seen a um, significant number of local councils, which don't perhaps have the same level of power that councils and regional governments have in, um, uh, in other parts of Europe, but nonetheless are an indication of local support saying they'd very much like to run a trial. And recently at the BN conference, the Basic Income Earth Network conference posted online, but at least putatively in Glasgow, um, we saw the first ministers of both Scotland and Wales there to express their support um, for the idea of a trial at least possibly even going further in the case of Wales. And so we have really strong support for the idea of a UBI. And I think what we're seeing, um, many people may be seeing reports about what's happening in the UK, about the, um, that we're seeing um, just, you know, as we head into a winter with prices rising fast, energy prices as they are in many parts of the world rising very fast, um, inflation, food prices rising, um, a real rising level of insecurity what government support there was has either ended or is being ended. And so I think we're going to see this, this whole issue potentially jump to, to the next new stage. And, you know, I have um, sort of uh, standing, uh, there's a minister who, when she sees me in the corridors, goes, so are you going to ask me about UBI today? Um, and my answer is usually yes, because it's a matter of, you know, there is rising interest. We don't see you know, the, uh, the Tory party, the Conservative party, are not going to back it soon. Unfortunately, Labour has moved away from it and ideologically is not very keen on it. But it's something we're starting to re see a real groundswell of public support. So that's where I'd, I'd say, you know, in, in short, that's what I'd say is, is what's happening in the UK at the moment. Um, I did many years ago after, after the BN um, uh, conference in Finland, write a piece you know, speculating on where, whether it would be a country with an already advanced welfare system that would go the step further or go to UBI, or whether it would be a you know country which has a really inadequate welfare system, which would suddenly see the need and, and make a great lump jump. And I think you know, I, at the moment, if you force me to put to put a bet on this, I think I'd probably go for a country that's you know really has an utterly inadequate welfare system like the UK. So thanks very much for that. All right, thank you for your input. That was really interesting. Um, I mean, it's sad to hear what like. The, the causes of all these of all these movements, but it's it's great to hear at the same time that there's uh, quite some movement outside of parliament, outside of the political parties happening um, that are fighting for basic income. Um, I think that's uh, encouraging for all of us. Are there any questions to Natalie Bennett directly? Otherwise, we have uh, next in line a question to Simo, but first I think there are questions from Simo and Valeria to Natalie, if I understand. So Simo, you had your uh, hand up first. 
Yeah, because because kind of uh, uh, the study that we did with Yulen Bolan about the steps towards basic income during the COVID pandemic, uh, I'm very I would like to hear a clarification from Natalie, kind of uh, on kind of uh, what kind of support the government provided during the pandemic in the UK. Because to me, it had seemed that uh, the government mostly uh, uh, supported uh, employers or employees to employers, and uh, there was only kind of more local money given to uh, social not benefits necessarily, but projects. Uh, is this accurate? Uh, you are Natalie, muted, muted still. Yeah. Natalie, you're still muted. Yeah. No. Sorry, I, I'm afraid I didn't hear any of that. The the intro call, the question dropped out. Apologies, I'm, I'm having technical problems here. But um, okay, I, I, I can uh, try to ask it more quickly. Uh, uh, it seems to me that during the pandemic in the UK, the government mostly uh, worked through to support employers or employees through employers, and uh, they were not so much done. To the social security system. Uh, is this correct? Uh, yes, I would broadly say that's true. I mean, the key thing, thing in terms of the social security system was a £20 uplift in what's known as universal credit. Um, and that's something that's just ended. And that's going to throw an enormous number of people into poverty. Um, you're right, I think that you know, what we saw was the furlough scheme. So a huge number of, of wages, salaries were paid to employees um, through their employers. What was expected to happen and what was feared would happen was at the end of the furlough scheme, there would be a huge drop off in employment. But what we're seeing, as, as many countries are seeing, perhaps more extreme than most because of the whole issue of Brexit, which is a whole other area on the side, um, is that um, we're seeing you know, not the high levels of unemployment that might have been expected. There is some real problems in that there's a lot of job vacancies, but many of them are for jobs that many people can't take, whether that's HGV drivers. And that's obviously, you know, a, a, an issue of skills, but also an issue of the kind of jobs. You know, it's not a job that fits in with a family life with caring responsibilities. Um, it's not a job, you know, physically even that, that many people would be able to do. So um, that is where a huge amount of the government money went. Um, we also saw a lot of support for businesses, including uh, businesses like airports, etc. So direct support to businesses. So yes, you know, there was some support through the universal credit uplift, but broadly speaking, it was done through businesses. Um, but we're not seeing the fallout from that side of things that perhaps people were predicting 12 months ago. All right, thank you. Before we go over to Valerie, just a, a short response, but really short from Zemo. Yeah, that we had the same kind of furlough schemes also, but uh, the problem with uh, kind of only increasing universal credit that you are uh, and working through furlough schemes is that you are missing out on the people who are not either on universal credit or people who were not employed when the pandemic started. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. Then over to you, Valeria. Yes, uh, thank you. I would uh, just like to say that uh, also in uh, during the COVID, uh, basic income got, uh, got people who were not um, um, beneficiaries for social assistance or unemployment benefits, self-employed people and clergy. But uh, I would like uh, to join uh, to Natalie with optimism about UK and basic income. Uh, of course, people from all around uh, Europe, um, well, we were looking uh, closely at what happened in UK after Brexit. And uh, like during this uh, basic income uh, conference and Bristol conference and everything what we can see is actually like uh, your civil society is very much alive. And I would say this so civil society come alive uh, through Brexit or because of Brexit. And now you have uh, such a, a great opportunity to put this movement uh, in the right direction. I mean, that's why I'm so optimistic. Thank you. Well, thank you. If I can just quickly respond to that, yeah. of course, one of the reasons why we have a, a powerful civil society is we have such a weak 
an inadequate politics. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, I'm sitting speaking to you, you can probably see the wood panelling in the background uh, from what's known as the mother of all parliaments. But we have a government that was won the support of 44% of the people who voted in 2019. And, you know, I'm joining you from the unelected House of Lords. Um, the very weaknesses of our politics, the fact that utterly fails to represent people or debate issues properly, is partly the reason why we have, I think, such a strong civil society. Um, but, you know, there are positives and negatives of that, and we're definitely working on the positives. Uh, I'm sorry, I just have to say, I mean, your bre Brexit is very similar to our independence in 91, you know, so I can, I can see this resemblance, that's why I said it, okay. Okay, thanks so much. Yes, so we've heard today from the uh, Jeff publication on um, the policy measures taken uh, during the pandemic in Europe that uh, Simo is a co-author of in the beginning. We've heard the national contribution from Valeria, the national contribution from Finland from Simo, and then um, a, a, a tad later from, from Natalie as well from the UK. And I think um, from these three countries at least, we have a good overview of um, what was happening during the pandemic, what, the, what kind of uh, measures were taken by the governments, and to which degree it is encouraging what's happening regarding basic income as in it is uh, picking up uh, yeah, traction and taking, picking up speed um, in these countries, although um, I think at least uh, for, for Simo, you said like there's the, there's the Green Party and there's the, there's, the, uh, there's the left, but other than that, there, there are no big supporters, let's say, at least in the, um, yeah, in the, in the established parties. Um, I want to thank you again, uh, Jeff, for so the Green European Foundation for organizing this and the Transition Verde for supporting um, the event. I'd like to thank um, there are uh, Luca and uh, Sol in the background, and especially I'd like to um, thank you, uh, Valeria, Simo, and Natalie, for uh, reporting from your countries and uh, letting us know what's happening or what was happening during the pandemic. Um, regarding UBI. I, I'm just unmuting for a little bit of colour. If you can hear those bells in the background, that means the House of Lords is having a vote. So that tells you a bit about the life in the House of Lords. <laughs> okay, thanks so much.